for now, if I can, get you to put your hands together and welcome back James Tozeland. And he's got a Guinness in his hand. It's the second half, we can tell. We don't spend enough time socially nowadays. I think the last time we were all pissed in Thailand um, for the, um, the uh, Thai Grand Prix, of course, we were working. Um, I miss great days like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's kind of like, um, should we talk about the broadcasting for a moment? Let's, let's, let's move on to that. I want to go back onto your career in a while because uh, there's so much of it that I've written here. I'm not going to ignore what I've written. I'm not going to do prep and then ignore it. But uh, let's talk about the broadcasting for a moment, shall we? I mean, you came back. Um, you were in a full music career. Um, you were married to a lovely lady, Katie Melua. That didn't go too well, did it, in the end? No. <laughs> Should we go there first? <laughs> what was my word before we started, Keith, on that? Be respectful, you yes. said. Well, I am, and I love Katie, and she was a nice lady. Excuse me, Angelica, if I may. Um, but it's, it's kind of one of those situations where uh, you two seemed a good item. You were musical, she was musical. She didn't race motorbikes, which is probably a good thing, because if you beat you, you were in the shit. <laughs> Um, but the point being is, is that um, obviously there was a, a long collaboration between the two of you. What happened? Well, I know this is filmed, so I have to be I have to be a little bit careful with it. But um, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it didn't end well. We we got divorced, which was um, you know, if anybody's been married and been through a divorce, huh. thank um, you. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's not something that you plan on, and it's not something that you choose. You know, when you're at the front of the altar and, and you're saying it's forever, uh, it, it was certainly not something I thought it would end, and uh, unfortunately uh, it did. Um, the first time I spoke about it was, was on your podcast. And, um, OMG, MotoGP. Make a note, please. Otherwise, Harry will be after you. But you know, I, I love being married. It was great. Um, and Katie's a wonderful person. You know, there's, there's, you're not going to hear a bad word out of my mouth about, about Katie. Uh, it didn't work out, unfortunately, but um, uh, it, it started off on on a, on a bit of a, an, an unsteady footing, shall we say. Um, she'd just gone through a really bad breakdown uh, mentally. Uh, she was hospitalised and everything, and, and I don't mind saying this because it is recorded, so I've got to be careful, um, but that's quite well known. So I'm, I'm only going to say things that uh, uh, I know that she wouldn't mind me talking about in a certain way. Um, and, um, and I just retired from racing because I literally met her and uh, I did two races trying with my wrist um, and I, it didn't bend and I, I realized after the second race in Germany it, it just wasn't possible to race and be competitive with a right wrist especially uh, to, to be competitive anymore in motorcycle racing uh, and she was at my side when I had to call the team and my manager then Roger Burnett uh, and everybody and my family and say I'm gonna have to stop this I, I can't do it anymore which was really really tough um, and she was there and she was recovering as well and we just magnetized together um, and we held each other uh, to a point where you know we fell in love obviously and, and, and we, we got married and um, but then as the years went by uh, I, I joined obviously the talking about broadcasting the BT sport team and being on the road uh, for seven months of the year um, with the with the calendar of MotoGP, she was a successful musician, as you know, and she was touring. Um, we didn't spend enough time together in the time that we were getting better, because we naturally just got better, because life got better when we were together. Um, to where we then, I, I I was obviously becoming a very very different existence, not being a racer. I was just becoming James again. Um, and to cut a long story short, by the time kind of eight years came along, um, a few things happened which upset me obviously, but I'll not mention them, but um, uh, um, we, we healed in a place where we didn't have the things in common that we needed. Uh, and that was, the, that was the crux of it. And, and we, we decided together that it wasn't the right thing to go forward. It wasn't making us happy. Uh, enough to consider getting divorced, which was a which is, was a really really difficult um, decision to make. You kind of hear, you know, superstars when they're on the road and the like. You've got um, career people that are, are, are married together. Uh, I have a little bit of experience in this, obviously. And you spend a lot of time away on the road. It's quite a, a lonely existence. You're living in hotels and all the rest of it. Sounds great, traveling business class. 
everything paid for, earning a fortune, rah, 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 which is great. But then the downside of that, obviously, is you're living in hotel rooms, they're quite sad places to be. Uh, you're away from home, things are happening at home um, that, that you know, you're not part of anymore. And it can be a very tricky lifestyle. I've been with you when you've spoken with Katie on the phone when we're at dinner and the kind of, you know, FaceTime's great. I mean, like nowadays, at least you can keep some kind of communication going, which seems to suit the kids okay, but perhaps not your wife. It's not the best way of um, interacting perhaps with your wife. If I can move it away from the downside of things, what about the upside? I mean, obviously Katie is a very, very talented musician. You are too. Um, was there any collaboration there? Was there any kind of, were you, did she influence you in any way musically or did you influence her in any way musically? Or was there anything where you used to sit around the piano and sort of sort out tunes together? Yeah, it was wonderful because if I couldn't ride motorcycles, I was playing the piano because that was the only two things I did in my life ever. Uh, so when I did finish racing and, and we were together, um, music was the, you know, the prominent subject all the time. And I liked that because luckily for Kate, even though I was a professional sportsman, I was a musician as well. So because um, she wasn't in my life very much for all my career at all. She did two races. So you can imagine all of the world championships and all of the, the circuits. She didn't marry her because you were a superbike world champion then? No, no, and, you know. She's Katie, so you know she doesn't she doesn't need anybody uh, of you know of of any kind of caliber to to, to marry you know. Um, but um, but it, it 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 was it was great on that front. Uh, and obviously you know touring touring with her and um, but you know the, my marriage to somebody is a subject tonight because of who she was and who she is. I mean, if, well, if I did a gig like this tonight and my, my girlfriend or my ex-wife was Sarah from Doncaster, this wouldn't be in your notes. It's, actually, it's not in my notes. <laughs> it's not in my notes at all. The great thing about doing anything with James is, is that I know if I go anywhere, if, if something starts to lean towards a conversation, you'll answer it, which is fucking scary sometimes. I mean, I, I've got so many things that I could ask you about rumours and the like that's around the paddock and have been, you know, so much gossip that we can talk about James. So when you're dealing with a superstar, you know, the back story all the time is like huge. It's much bigger than what most people will see reported on or spoken about in the press or in the media generally. And from a, now a journalist, not a writer, obviously, from a, from a journalistic point of view, you've got to sift all that shit out. Otherwise, I, I could have you talking about stuff you never want to talk about here because it's rumour and innuendo and quite often with an agenda behind it that is derogatory towards you which I would never go near with 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 anybody let alone a friend so it's a it's a it's a strange place to be in. you have to cope with all of that you've had to cope with you know the situation that you found yourself in uh, early retirement you've had to cope with the, the situation with your, your stepdad back in the day I mean there's quite a lot been on your plate over the years at a very young age I'll remind you he's still only 43 years old which is slightly scary um, there's a lot crammed in here at the moment. So if we can move probably slightly more positively, musically, if you didn't collaborate so much, what, what sort of lent you towards the rock scene? Other than, than the obvious connection between bikes and rock. But I mean, what, what made you go that way? What made you, you know, why didn't you go to a slightly more popish type scenario? I needed, I needed an energetic thing to put my, um, my, my, my energy into to, to get the same outlet or similar outlet to racing was. So when I was on stage doing rock and roll with a band kicking ass on stage and making a, a racket, um, it was a similar, similar buzz to riding at 200 miles an hour. Uh, because when I'm at home, I play like this, because it's a piano and it's ballad based usually, because that's really where the piano lends itself to. You know, I didn't learn the drums or lead guitar. You know, I learned the piano, so, and I was classically taught as well. So. You know, my heroes were like Elton John and Freddie Mercury, and uh, and and then when I when I got introduced to Queen, it was amazing because like I got so much shit at school for learning the piano. You know, it wasn't cool. You know, at all. You have actually headed your own way throughout life, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, you haven't gone with a popular sort of direction. No, I remember a massive sign at Brands Hatch in 2003. Hodgson's no piano player. He's world champion. <laughs> <laughs> massive banner. And I, and I remember riding past thinking, fuck, you know, that must have took a while. 
That's what hurt me. I was thinking, how many crayons did it take for that? <laughs> and that's what, you know, it was, I, I could deal with the piano player in Hodgson's World Champion. I, could, I, I dealt with that. I was thinking, that took a while, that did. That, that really, that, that's personal. Yeah, but he's only been one time. Oh. <laughs> yes. Hey, I could ride past again, but, um, but, but it, it was, I was against the grain, and I realised that, not intentionally though, you know, I was born the way I was, and, and I am who I am, uh, and sometimes you've just got to kind of uh, keep your head down and, and, and follow your path and walk your direction, you know, and that's, that's what I did, you know, with Kate, I was like, Kate, this is not for me, uh, I'm, I'm not happy, this is not making us happy, uh, and, and this cannot be forever. I promised forever, but I thought if this is going to be my forever, I'm not going to be in a good place, you know, after we'd recovered. So, uh, and I, you know, made the decision to, um, to, to change that path again. So music aside then, who were, in fact, no, not music aside, who was your influence musically? Did you have a massive influence? I mean, I don't know who the favorite bands here. I was listening to Pearl Jam last night, which are one of my favorites. Um, Maybe you can do an alive for me in a little while. Quick Queen was my, my biggest influence. I remember getting, you know, Ken came into my life uh, and we, we got in his car with the trailer on the back. The very first time we, were, we put the trials bikes on the trailer and we went out to go trials riding and he turned this music on. And I was, you know, my mum was a bit more of a kind of, um, a bit more of a pop, like Beatles, he kind of, a kind of, you know, middle of the road kind of. She like, sounds a bit Carole King. Yeah. Yeah, carpenters, that kind of thing, you know? And then I turned, and, and he liked it loud as well, like a bit uncomfortably loud. And all of a sudden, Queen came out of the speakers, and I was like, shit, you know? And it was like, it was the same experience of going on the pillion on the bike with him, was in the car listening to that kind of music, and like, One Vision, and uh, We Are The Champions, and all, all, all the song titles seemed to correlate every, everything you wanted to do on, on the track. You know, it was all motivational kind of song titles, and, 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 and the lyrics were all exactly what you wanted to do in life and, 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 and especially on a motorcycle as well so and then when I saw the band live as well on, on TV and he sat behind the piano and played the piano doing it I was like oh, all, all of a sudden I felt like you know what I did was kind of cool for the first time because at school it was not cool at all and I was really lucky that my grand played and I was really close to my grand like really close that I just made a pact that didn't matter what anybody said or thought about it I was always going to enjoy because the one thing that I, what really like got my interest in, in, in playing an instrument was at Christmas time, especially this time, she used to sit behind a piano and she created the party. My grand used to sit behind a piano and start playing the Christmas carols and it was like a, a honey pot and the bees just kind of went, came around singing the songs and she was the Christmas party. And I was like, someone and an instrument can create that joy and happiness in a room. And I, I've always been a bit of a showman, whether it be on a bike or on a, on a thing. I thought I want, to, I want to be able to create that atmosphere for everybody. And that's one thing, I didn't care what people said, I kept it up luckily. Actually, life sounds good around your grandmother. Mine used to come in with a fag hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> Get out of the fucking way. <laughs> Moving back towards motorcycle racing, I mean, it, it happened at a very young age for you, and not easy to get to where you got to. You came through Super Teens, you came through CB 500 Cup, I think, and then on to Super Sport, but it seemed every step of the way through your bike career was not an easy one. It was one that you almost had to force to fit each, each way. Is that, would that be reasonable to say that? Yeah, because I came through quickly. You know, I was like Super Teens, CB 500, 600, then into the World Championships within three years. And you know yourself, there's a, there was a huge difference between national level and, and, and world level. Um, and it's not just riding ability. Like I, I always, I, I just want to make, you know, make that statement. It's not about ability, it's about experience. You know, the, the, the traveling and the tracks that you know. I mean, I remember when I went from World Superbikes to MotoGP, I, I didn't know at all seven tracks of the calendar. And I can't stress to you, like going down pit lane and not really knowing if it's a right or left first, against Valentino Rossi and Casey Stoner and all the rest of the boys, right? And you're trying to get within a day and a half, within half a second. It's like, I, then I realized thinking, shit, you know, all of like that, all that tuition that you've got from Cadwell Park, Mallory Park, Knock Hill and all that when you're kids, you know, if I raced against, if I raced against Valentino Rossi and Casey Stoner around Brands Hatch, 
I would have won. I can hands on say I would have won, you know. But against him in Magella, where he grew up for 15 years. And That's the thought. I mean, nowadays we've got obviously simulators. People are using Sims and, and even PS4, PS5. It's very, very accurate now. Even the bumps and the trees and the barriers and everything that's on it. Okay, you're not got the, the wind and the, and the deflection that you're going to get from something like that. But it's all quite accurate to learn a track almost before you get there. Yeah, but it still doesn't take away the, the, the forces and stuff, does it, and the speeds. And, um, and, but that was the biggest thing that I, 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 I kind of I didn't, I didn't take into consideration when I went from superbikes because of that. But, you know, like, like I say, it was, and that was the difference from national racing to world championships. And now my first race, luckily, in world championships was at Donington Park, Castrol Honda. Chris Herring. Chris Herring. In 1998, we just launched the new team because it was the first year of being a, an official world championship in 1998. I was teammates to a, a wonderful Belgian guy called Michael Paquet, um, who unfortunately in round two of that year lost his life. That was tough as well. Um, I'd broke my ankles both at the same time as well in this round two at Monza. Uh, so all the team was wiped out. And that was my baptism of my fire of, of, of being in a world championship. And, um, but that's one of the big reasons why I'm here tonight is because Chris Herring, obviously, he, he has this place. Um, he was a, a massive help because I was with Mick Corrigan at the time. And as I, as I said before, Mick Corrigan's team was the only reason why I could go racing. Well, Mick Corrigan, he, he, he got in trouble through the winter of that year and got sacked. So I was in trouble again. I didn't have anybody to take me racing. Uh, but then luckily Castrol Honda signed me um, and then it was Chris that came to my house and he was the press officer, press officer for, for the team and, and did a few things and uh, uh, he helped me out. He got my, my leathers and helmets and, and my boots and all, all the deals sorted out for me. Uh, and Chris, I want to thank Chris from, from the bottom of my heart. He was a massive, massive help for me when, when I first joined World Championships. And, uh, he, he deserves, deserves a round of applause for that. There's not too long in the... Uh in the past that uh, Chris hasn't affected somebody somewhere in our road racing game there's no doubt about it bad luck Mark you've been overshadowed on this one buddy <laughs> memories early memories what are your best from motorcycle racing I mean when you go through super team super uh, uh, through CB500 Cup to super sport up to world Superbikes, I would imagine that world Superbikes, obviously once you got in there was a, was a big memory but before that prior to that what was your the thing that you thought Shit, I'm on here. This is this is it. I'm gonna be top man. Ooh. Top man at world level. Well, you probably would have been dreaming like that because I think most yeah. people that are going on their way are dreaming about being the top man. There's yeah. no doubt about it. But what was it? What indicator? Did you have an indicator? Was there anything, or were you just plowing through it day by day, week by week? I had an indicator in, in the UK when I when I first jumped on a super sport bike, and in my second race, I, I won at Mallory Park against Jim Moody, John Crawford, Howard Whitby. Uh, and the real top boys in super sport, and they were the top top guys. And I was 16 years old, and I thought, okay, I've got I've got a chance of this being something. Um, and then in the interview that you did with Jim Moody at, at Mallory Park, um, with <laughs> he said, chuffing out, being beaten by a sporty little Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all, that's recorded. He's been, having, he's, been, he's been having creams ever since, as you can <laughs> see. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> he's quite well preserved now. <laughs> Uh, so that was that moment, and then um, the real big moment in World Superbikes was Assen 2002. Uh, I got my very first podium. I was on the podium with Colin Edwards um, and Pierre Francesco Keeley. Uh, Colin won uh, the race. Uh, I was fifth in the race, doing all right. I was, I was thinking that was going to be my best result anyway. Uh, but then Harger and Hodgson um, came together, took each other off in the gravel, and I didn't even see him go off. So I came past the pits and it said P3 on my pit board. I thought the team's got the bloody numbers room mixed up. <laughs> and, but it, it was, it was third. And, and I was on the podium uh, and I was, uh, in fact, on the slowing down lap, Neil Hodgson came up to me uh, and gave me a big old hug, bless, bless him, uh, and said a few things. And then I was on the podium with those two guys um, and at Assen with the crowd and on the podium, I thought, okay, I was fifth anyway. I've been given third, it was a bit of a gift. Um, but I'm in the top five, I'm getting the hang of it. Let's talk about relationships. I was only 21. You were. Yeah. And it was young, wasn't it? It was young. Yeah. I mean, like, even then, I mean, at the end of the day, because I think that as we've moved on through, through racing years, everyone's got a lot younger at everything they do, but 21 back then was bloody young. Yeah. 
Let's talk about relationships generally. I mean, obviously, you mentioned Hodgie, who's, as anybody following it, is 50 years old this week. I mean, Hodgie and you both, um, what's the word I should say, managed by Roger Burnett. Roger Burnett, top rider himself, British Championship, TT, rah, 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 rah. But the slipperiest fucker you've ever come across in your life when it comes to business. He's very, very sharp, very, very clued up, very, very good for you, very, very good for Hodgie. Worked quite well together. But relationship-wise, around the paddock, how did you get on with Hodgie first, as a teammate? Um, I, th I think as teammates go, because it's a strange old couple of words, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, the people that uh, are in the other side of the garage are the your least friend <laughs> in the world, because the first person to beat is your teammate. Uh, but if I had to say that if I had a mate as a teammate, uh, it would be Neil Hodgson, for sure. Because I, I, I came from British Superbike, I only had half a year with Paul Bird. I was his very first Superbike rider, Paul Bird, in 2000, 20, what, three years ago. Um, bless him. Um, and he had uh, McGuinness in 250 and Stuart Easton in 125. And, and, and we had a really strong first half of the season. I broke my leg really badly at Cadwell Park, and, and that, was, that was the end of that. But when I joined GSC Racing, HM Plant, um, the team went from British Superbike Championship when they won. I remember when Walker broke down on the last lap in 2000. And Donington Park, yeah, big smoky one. Yeah. So they went from BSB to World Championships. And um, they had Niall McKenzie as the teammate to Neil Hodgson at the time. And Niall was staying in BSB, uh, so they needed a teammate for Neil Hodgson. And, and, and luckily for me, even though I went into the meeting on crutches with Colin, Ed, uh, Colin Wright, sorry, the team boss, uh, they still signed me, even on crutches. So that was, that was lucky. Um, from that point on, I was no threat to Neil, pace-wise. I'd not been ridden a bike for eight months because of my leg. And I was then on a V-twin, uh, no, sorry, a, a, a twin Ducati that I'd, I'd not really got any experience on, and it was a fast bike. So it took me a while to get up to speed, and he helped me a lot. And when you're no threat to your teammates, they help, they, they help you a lot, and the team helped me a lot. Uh, and the faster I got, the uh, uh, just as I got fast enough to start beating him in Oshisleben, because it was me and him that, that hit each other, um, he went off to MotoGP, and that's why we stayed friends. Because <laughs> he taught me to go so fast, and just at the time I could beat him, he went on to other things, and we were stayed friends. Mate, you got it easy with Hodgy. I had Barry Sheen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, was not beating him. It was tough to beat. He was tough on and, and off the track. <laughs> but wonderful parents, Franco and Iris, no longer with us anymore. Um, obviously, Barry's no longer with us. Um, Maggie is not well, his sister. Paul Smart was killed on a motorbike, if you remember last year, if you uh, followed that up. Um, Scott Smart, the uh, nephew of Sheen, is still around and making the rules for lots of superbike championships at the moment. Um, but getting back on track, we've got to go really with another teammate that we hear quite a lot about. We, uh, back in the day, world superbike riders were being sucked into MotoGP. A lot of you guys were being you know, poached from World Superbikes into MotoGP. Obviously now with the, the glut of riders that we've got, if you like, they're all going back the other way at the moment. Um, when you saw, I mean, it was the like of Hodgie went across as well, wasn't a good team that he went to. There were a lot of sub, you know, standard rides, if you like, that went there. But how did you see it back in the day? Did you think that MotoGP was the place that, you know, you needed to be, you needed to be in that class rather than World Superbikes? Or did you think Superbikes were I think MotoGP has always been the pinnacle of motorcycle racing, even in the 500 days. But I, I think as nations, we get biased. You know, in the 70s and 80s, obviously, you know, the 500 Grand Prix was very, very popular because of Barry. But in the 90s, when I was growing up and some of you guys were growing up, um, it was foggy, you know, and it was superbikes, wasn't it? And so it, it, and also superbikes got so popular that it was just as popular as the 500 racing, but in this country, especially because of Carl Fogarty, um, and, and, and that influence you can't underestimate. But for me personally, once I'd become a double world champion, and I was kind of arguably pulling 126,000 people at Brands Hatch in, in, in 07 to, to win the championship, then it becomes a business. You know, Dorna and, and everything else think, hang on a second, we need those ticket sales in MotoGP as a British rider, because there wasn't one at that time, you know? So, that it depends what uh, you're doing as a, as, a, as a British racer or a Spanish racer or a French racer for the actual income as well for the business. And on goes the same problem, of course. British Grand Prix, 45,000 people last year at the uh, 
British Grand Prix of Silverstone, it's just not good enough considering where we are. And they do plough a lot of money into it, Dorna. You know, they paid basically for Jake Dixon to be where he is before him, Jeremy McWilliams. You know, Rory Skinner's just got the boot out of Motor Jeep out of Motor Two, which is very, very sad indeed. American Racing have had some implosion in their brains regarding Rory Skinner and not decided to stick with him for a second year in his contract. Um, something that sticks in my mind, getting back to a more amusing side of things, is that you said something along the lines that you would celebrate in the nude at British um, at the British Grand Prix. I seem to remember. Nude? No. <laughs> I have it written here, and I looked it Never up. Never knew it. I confident. looked it up special. Well, I thought that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know me well enough to not I'll tell you what, the only bloke when you go to the toilet, he stands there like that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You're not looking at my lip, You'd never see me running down the South Engine of Brands Archway that up. No chance. The relationship with Colin Edwards is something that, again, we probably need to touch on. Having spoken with on the OMG podcast recently, um, Colin came on, and I asked him about the relationship in the garage. He didn't say anything that was uh, derogatory in any way whatsoever, but he said that, that Hervé uh, Poncheral and Guy Coulon decided to swap sides effectively, you know, when they figured that it would be better if your side of the garage worked with him and his side of the garage worked with you. It didn't work out quite how you were expecting, did it, at, um, at, at Tech 3, when you would have thought it would have done, it would have suited you. Those guys were good guys yeah. to work with. Yeah, Guy Coulon was the most experienced engineer in, in the team. Um, and he still is in the Tech to our team. The guy looks like the nutty professor of the. Uh, back to the How many gigawatts? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and in, the, in the first year that I was there, he was working with a guy called Gary Reinders. Um, and Gary was. They, they, tech to our and Yamaha, they wanted and needed me really to do better than Colin uh, because I, I was younger and British and, and, and the market was good. And Colin was just coming to the age of, of and, and his career. He just lost his factory ride, and um, they they would have preferred if that I could have stayed on. Um, so they decided, or everybody decided. I had a word with Gary, and he wanted to, Gary wanted to change. That was one thing that made it awkward. Um, he would say like, "I will change, or I'm going to change teams," and they didn't want Gary to change teams. So we all had a meeting about it, and Hervé Poncheral thought it was the best thing to change. But I didn't realize through all the conversations that Colin really wasn't in the loop of, of stuff. And then I realized, obviously, Gary was then having to tell Colin that he's going to change. That did go down well, you know. Um, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure really why... Well, I don't know whether he didn't want to work with Guy Coulon or if he was just annoyed why the team should change the structure. And I, I was preferring the option because Gary spoke English really well and Guy didn't really speak English very well, he was French and, and it was a bit of a, a lack of communication on my side with the chief engineer. So I was quite happy with it, but then Colin wasn't because of the way it was dealt with. And I completely got it. Colin went berserk through the winter um, and then I went into his motor home at the first race and, and we ba both sat down with a beer and I went, mate, this is how it rolled out for me. I don't want to fall out with you because I remember everything that Colin said when, we, when I was 17 years old and Colin stuck up for me massively in Supersport, uh, and he's a great guy. Um, and it was a shame that that situation kind of un unraveled. Um, and and, and that's, that's really kind of, that's really how it was. But unfortunately, the biggest problem was we went from my first year with Michelin tires, and then the second year was with Bridgestone tires. And the setup of the bike was absolutely completely different. And Yamaha had not ridden with Bridgestones much, only with Valentino when he kicked up the fuss he wanted to change, remember? And like the rear wheel had to come uh, f like one linkage uh, shorter on the rear and, and the front headstock had to be changed. So it, it, it just backfired massively because it didn't matter what engineer we'd got because the bike was completely re-engineered. They had the same problems when it went the other way in 2013, 14, whenever it was, when they went from, Mich uh, from Bridgestones to Michelin's. I was at the Sepang test in Malaysia and everybody crashed their brains out. There was millions and millions of pounds worth of damage done in the first uh, day yeah. of testing because the balance of the bikes were completely wrong. So it was, it was a shame, and, but, they, but the team did it because they really wanted and needed me. I was 27 at the time. Colin would have been, what, 34 or something. And they really wanted me to go because there was a certain Ben Spees coming, winning everything in World Superbikes, and the British rider and American rider, they wanted in Tech 12 was me and Ben. Not, two Americans, not two Texans, because that wasn't great for, for business, obviously.
But unfortunately, I, I had a massive crash, a massive injury at the beginning of the season, and um, Ben won every. Well, he won the championship in the first year of World Superbikes, and that's incredible. So he deserved everything that he got, obviously. And then an arm injury that took him out of the game. Yeah. So at the end of the day, Ben Spees, who is still quite, you know, he's opinionated. If you follow any of the social media stuff, Ben Spees is still involved in quite a lot of things in that. Always interesting to hear his take on things, particularly at the moment with Mark Marquez. Um, politics in, in our sport, obviously it's something that catches up on all of us at some stage in broadcasting or in racing. But back in the racing days, we talked about Colin Edwards. Obviously there was a lot of politics going on in the background there that you didn't really know much about. Has that improved at all or is that still a pain in the arse that riders have to deal with you know, situations happening that they've not been party to? Um, we're talking about a new riders' union that's coming for next year in MotoGP. Uh, Sylvain Gintoli apparently is going to be like the spokesperson for the new MotoGP riders' union. The politics of it is, is quite tricky, isn't it, to, to, to manage. Did you manage all of yours? Did you have a manager behind you during the course of your racing career? That was looking after your interests like so many do nowadays or did you do it all yourself no no roger burnett did, did all of the business and rbp uh, it was a fabulous company that, uh, that looked after me and looked after everything else that was going on and obviously uh, each year you're planning what you're doing um in around may time you know so you've only done about three or four races in a season before you're then negotiating for what's going to happen next year because the teams need to decide what riders they're having to then have contact with their sponsors um, that are, are involved with the team to see there's no conflict of interest and it, would the rider be of interest to them, nationality or whatever it may bring of, of a rider coming into it. So um, you need to pass all that before you can confirm all of that. Uh, and you can imagine all the things that are happening behind the scenes of, of the artwork and uh, the designs. and uh, There's a lot of money going on uh, behind the scenes to, to make a transition of a new rider coming. The only thing that's a bit uncomfortable at the minute in MotoGP is, is contracts aren't being uh, kind of seen through. Uh, from the manufacturer side on the rider's side at the minute. I think that's always been the case. I think what it is, though, it, it's become slightly less ungentlemanly in as much as they can dump you. Mind you, as a rider, you can dump them as well. Look what Mark Marcus has done. He's, he's, I mean, he's dumped sides. Honda. It works both ways. I think, but contract, hasn't that always been the case with contracts? If it doesn't suit you or doesn't suit them, there's a way out. I've, I've never known a rider that's under contract that's actually chosen to move and a manufacturer like taking the option up that they can move. That's the unusual thing at the minute. Is that wrong or right? Uh, who knows? I mean, it's quite honourable, really, of Honda to let Mark go uh, to, 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 to choose this new venture of his to, to seek out success again when he's under contract. Because of what success is given Honda, that's, that, and that's unlike Honda. I'm surprised that the Japanese, with how honourable they are, I'm surprised that they've kind of uh, they've, they've let well, that one slip through the net because, you know, Luca Marini's got some big shoes. But there's been a sea change in the way that Honda look at things. They were running a Calex swinging arm. That's a man different manufacturer to Honda. There's no way that Honda would have a non-Honda part on their part on their bike in the past. I think they're looking to new, and they've got to look to new management. I mean, the Japanese have fallen behind massively at Yamaha and at Honda. And so Mark could have noticed that. Oh, for, for sure, sure he, he would have done. Mark, Mark, Mark riding a Calex chassis, yeah. which is Moto Two. That's, that's what that's what you're going to look at, it as, aren't you? Yeah, so, it's not going to make. We've got Moto Two guys designing things for me, Moto GP bike, and not HRC in Japan. It, it, you would have noticed things like, and you know, on Mark's situation with the arm and the operations, and how close he was to having to retire, and then coming back and that bike flicking him off regularly, in kind of like unusual circumstances, trying to keep up and be competitive. Uh, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that he's made that decision. It's obvious on track because when you're on track against the Ducati and you're not on a competitive bike, you can see exactly how much it's pulling away from you. And when a bike pulls away from you that much on the straights, what do you have to do to try and keep up? You have to get on the gas earlier. Or brake later. Too early. Or brake later. Both. Don't you? And if you're braking later and getting on the gas earlier than these guys, well, you're ending up in the gravel into turn one or the moon out of turn one. We were talking about it just in the break a minute ago. It's quite funny because my era is back in really grand prix back in my era was like a club race you know you could turn up at the gate you could force your way through to an entry which you could never do nowadays um, you could ride a privateer motorcycle that was <coughs> excuse me beer um, that was was capable of doing reasonably well but the big issue and we were talking about it uh, just a moment ago i finished second at the british grand prix sorry to bang on about it, it sounds terribly um about me, 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 but um, it was an incident where I was from here to the bar away from the guy that was in second place on the final corner of the final lap. 
and I outbraked him to get to the flag to finish on the podium behind the world champion as was Anton Mang back in the day. Mate, if you break an inch later now than the bloke in front of you, you're going to the car park. The way that things are now are so much more, the riders are all athletes, we weren't, we drank beer and smoked fags. You, your tires are bang on it, control tires everywhere nowadays. Interesting to see Moto3 and Moto2 so fast today. Um, testing at Valencia, they're going to be quicker on Pirelli's than they ever were on Dunlops. But it's a control tire situation. ECUs, electronic controls, inertial platforms are all spec now. Magneti Morelli in MotoGP. Everything now is really about the rider getting the tiniest best bit out of what is a, a standard item. Well, I think from your area, Keith, you had Kenny Roberts that was the first person all of a sudden to get the knee down. Remember? from sitting in the middle of the seat like the old boys used to, without any knee sliders or anything, it wasn't even a consideration, was it, to stick your knee out? It was duct tape. <laughs> we had duct tape. Yeah. Yeah. I've got the scabs. So, and then we went from, from that to many more years on to where you got the elbow down with Mark Marquez. And so we got Kenny Roberts with the knee down, Mark Marquez with the elbow down, and I think we've almost got to the extremities of what you can do as a human being to counter the centrifugal forces and all the rest of it that is riding the motorcycle to the limits. You see, that's, that's where I think that you might be wrong for the first time in Jay Sutherland's life, because... Is I it head down next? I think, yeah. I mean, we've is seen it head down. We've seen Scott Redding with his head down, scraping his helmet on the floor. That's the one on his head, by the way. It's one of those situations where I think that, that that's the wonderful thing about motorcycle racing. We were talking with Harry earlier on. Harry, Harry Benjamin is a, is a Formula One guy, he's a car guy. But the bike boys make the difference. They move themselves around the bike, they make the difference. You know, Mick Doohan, if you looked at his style now, you'd all have a bit of a laugh at Mick Doohan. On the left. The right was right, wasn't it? The left. But it was just incredible how he rode a motorcycle. You couldn't, Kevin Schwantz was as loose as a bleeding jelly. You couldn't work out how on earth he did it. Motorcycle racing is brilliant from the individualistic interpretation of everything they do. Mark Marcus is just a. But back then, with Mick Doohan's style and Kevin Schwantz's style, was on the same bikes with such different styles of being able to ride those bikes. With the technology now, with the wings and all the electronics and the anti-wheelie, there seems to be a real sweet spot of that real hanging off, so elbow that, down. So how are you about that? I mean, obviously Casey Stoner was the first to bail because, you know, obviously he was sick at one point and he couldn't quite work out what his illness was. But also electronic interference really pissed him off. He didn't like any of that. Um, where we, we would be now, Casey Stoner would, would positively hate it. We saw Alvaro Bautista, you know, world champion, world superbike, jumped on a MotoGP bike the other day. In the dim and distant past, you could probably do that. You know, we've seen people win from world superbikes, jump on a MotoGP bike and win the race in Valencia. Who was it? Was it Bayliss? It was Bayliss, yeah. Um, sorry, uh, I couldn't remember. Uh, old age. Um, but the point being is, is that Alvaro Bautista could only just finish last. Yeah. because of the amount of electronics, the amount of control now, and the amount of stuff you have to be able to... It's almost like Formula One. We've got to that point. No, riding a MotoGP bike compared to a conventional production bike in, in, in World Superbikes is a vast difference of how to ride a motorcycle. The ride height device especially. I mean, can you imagine pressing that device, going into a corner, and then when you open the throttle, the thing just squats down as though like the linkage has fallen out. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, I've never ridden. I've never ridden on the system, but y you can imagine the sensation. It's nothing like a, a conventional motorcycle racer ever has to deal with. And also, can you imagine thinking of having to do all these controls? If you're honestly, Bautista was like, you know, 1.2 seconds off or whatever, right? I, I can tell you, they did a study. If you have to think about doing something, rather than it subconsciously happening, you're half a second. So if you've got three things on those handlebars that you have to control on a MotoGP bike that you don't have to do on a superbike, well, he's 1.1 and a half seconds off. Yeah, so just because I'm having to think about it. It's, it's the same in commentary. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> no, it is though, isn't it? it, it absolutely, absolutely, right? I, I remember sitting next to John Reynolds at Carnaby, of all places, bloody dump in the north. But I was in, Car sorry, Chris. <laughs> I was at Carnaby and I was doing a commentary with uh, John Reynolds and, and I always used to think of myself as, as quite sharp, could see stuff coming. But he was stamped the floor just that millisecond before me, he saw motorcycle moving before I did. And that's basically what happens, isn't it? Your, your top guys, if you wonder their cat-like reactions, it is exactly what James is saying. It's not a conscious thing at all. It's an absolute instinctive manoeuvre. 
and it, that even translates through in the end when you get older to commentary in that you see something just that split second before anybody else does and you bang the table or, or well, stand you, you the floor. talked about Troy Bayliss. Troy Bayliss on, on, on the 999, I think he was still on in 2006 and then he rode the MotoGP bike. He'd, he'd only been not riding a MotoGP bike for one or two years because he came back to Superbikes the year before, so he was kind of up to speed with it. Um, and, and there was nothing on a MotoGP bike that there was an, on a Superbike. And I think that was the last time where the technology, other than the carbon brakes, the, sh the stiffer chassis, which makes it feel much different, but actually uh, r ripping it, gripping it, and having a good go with a throttle brake and a clutch, it was still the same. How would you change things? Let's, let's look to the future. I mean, Dorna have got a problem. All these gadgets and gizmos that are on a motorbike nowadays that really aren't going to benefit anybody on the road. You're not going to have a, a ride height adjustment that's going to benefit anybody on the road. We always end up with that, the technicality of it. But with the manufacturers having to agree across, unanimously across the, the entire board, they have to agree to anything that is allowed or disallowed. Would you favour Dorna stepping in and saying ride height adjusters are unsafe because of tyre pressures because of tyre wear or something along those lines. Do you think Dorna need to get a grip on this and to, to bring us back to where we need to be? Um, I, I don't think the ride eye device is, is dangerous because I can't remember the last, I mean, in fact, no, I do. It was just at the weekend, but it was through a kink. But high sides, you don't see many out of corners anymore at all. It's all Michelin front tyre low sides and fast ones as well. Those Michelin fronts, when they lose a bit of temperature, oh, crikey, they, they don't half go, do they? So, um, but with, uh, with wings and the like, anything aero, that's the problem that Michelin have at the moment with the tyre pressure being higher or lower. We've, we've, you know, we saw Tijian Antonio losing his position at the weekend because his tyre pressure, you know, Frankie Carcetti, his crew chief, is killing himself at the moment because Digi lost that second place down to fourth because the tyre pressure was below... And the, that, the mark for 50 percent of the race yeah and that is that is important if there's a rule for tire pressures it's important to keep that because there is big advantages and disadvantages of, of, of going either way with it so uh, rules are rules and i think they've they've pretty got it they've, they've got it good but the, the the technology is just getting onto the limits where a lot of riders can get off a corner very very similar because of the ride out device and the wings that keep the the, the front down so that it doesn't wheelie um, to where everybody gets off the corner very, very similar. And if you get off a corner very similar and a bike doesn't do much wrong, everybody's going to go down that straight most of the time the same. You know, what, what creates overtaking is when a bike doesn't do what it's supposed to do and you have a bit of a step up when the rear comes out on you and you have to shut off a little bit and you have to control it. And if you're having to control a slide because the tyre's going off and you're not really getting off the corner that well as you did do 10 laps ago, the guy behind might have had a bit of a better throttle control and looking after a tyre a bit better and he can then get better drive off that corner and get past you on the next lap halfway through the race and all of a sudden you've got a margin where things can go wrong. The things with MotoGP bikes, they don't go really wrong until the chequered flag. And if they don't go wrong, and they've got the fastest bikes with Ducati, they go down the straights the fastest, and KTM's really improved. That's why the Hondas and Yamaha's haven't got a chance, because the KTM's and the Ducati's don't do anything wrong, and they're the fastest bikes. Have you ridden one of these bikes? No. Do you want to? Do you I ever get offers? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Not well, you, my wrist. You, well, you, actually, that's a good point. Your wrist, you, you're in for more surgery with that. Yeah, one, one more time in, in two weeks I fly to America in, in, on the 6th of December, yeah. And what do you expect from that? Is this, you know, you're still only 43 years old. Mm -hmm. Rossi didn't retire until he was 42 years yeah. old. Yeah, um, we got, yeah. Actually, that's a good point. We can go to the Rossi situation because you used to party a little bit with uh, Valentino, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's enough said of that. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be some film in this key, I told you. Turn the cameras off and we can have it, but... There were some strange rumours about um, uh, Valentino in the in the past. It was quite funny that not with me, by the way. <laughs> Let's just clarify that. Maybe you weren't the lucky one. <laughs> there was, there, there, um, Uccio, uh, uh, what's his name? Alessio Salucci, um, the, the, his his best mate and team, don't, don't, team manager way, nowadays. Do, please do not just Rossi because she's Italian. I'm not going to. She'll have you. She'll have you. Ciao, baby. You've just my almost. She'll not allow you to just Rossi. <laughs> Actually, I couldn't. 
to be honest, no, because no, he has been, I mean, what anybody ever says about I don't, I don't want a full time those two years with me, Colin, and Jorge Lorenzo in the Yamaha camp. I mean, to tour the world, race motorcycles for a living, and do promotional things with Valentino Rossi, Jorge Lorenzo, Colin Edwards, from a lad, honestly, like, if you could see, you know, the upbringing bringing in Sheffield, like, it was a good do. It was a really good do. In what way specifically? Just, I'm, I mean, unfortunately, those those three guys were, were a bit quick for my liking. Uh, so I'm talking more off track, mate. I've off got to say, on track is fine. Track. We've got that off sorted. Off track, I could hold my own, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> you probably had to with them three about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but to be honest, I mean, Valentino was too too famous. Um, anything that we did with Valentino, it, it was always behind the scenes and. You know, really hush hush because uh, everywhere you went in the world, it was uh, it was it was like you were, it was like you having dinner with the Beatles, you know, or uh, you know someone maybe a bit more modern than the Beatles. I liked, uh, but it was it was that kind of fame. So, uh, Jorge Lorenzo was was a really interesting character. He thought I was serious. I was going to say yeah. I would have put Jorge similar to you in yes. in some respects. Yeah. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because the way I think about Jorge Lorenzo, if I'm similar, like, you know, <laughs> I thought it was worse than me, but he's not. You know, I've been out with you when you're partying, and I know that you can, and, and that won't be on camera either. The, I, just the, it was just fascinating because he was the Spaniard, Valentino was the Italian, Colin was a, a Texan, and like, it's like, you know, when, when you're from Sheffield in, in the UK, even when you go to Benidorm on holiday, you're looking for a, a red lion pub, aren't you? <laughs> you know what I mean, and when you when you sat down at dinner with like such like um, massive like influential people in your sport, but they're also culturally so different, and and the one thing that British people aren't good at is is really embracing different cultures. Uh, not not good at they don't understand it. We're not very good at understanding different cultures, and, and it, when when I was with those with those guys with what they were dealing with with Valentino, I was because. Valentino was always really like gracious and, 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 and such a good friend and, and normal. But then, it, uh, then it, I, I was reminded of who he was as soon as we walked out the place. And, and I, I didn't envy that, honestly, too much, because I've always been a quite a shy guy. And to be that famous, honestly, it is a bit of a pain in the ass. It is. How did he deal with it? I mean, what was, I mean, you weren't obviously in his shoes, but you were close to them. But how did he deal with that kind of situation? I mean, it, it, any superstar, has obviously got a problem with that. He had good people around him. I was going to say, did he have people? He had good people around him that, that avoided uh, most of it because you, because you got to. You've got to preempt everything that you're doing that day. You know, where are you going to go for breakfast? You know, well, hopefully, let's, let's find that quiet spot and make sure that this, that this guy doesn't know and make sure he doesn't say anything that is coming. You know, everything's planned. And, and it, it's really, it, it, I, I don't find, I don't envy, I don't envy the, the, the people that, who were that famous. I mean, we've seen a couple of the documentaries, haven't we, with David Beckham. Have you seen Def, David Beckham on Netflix? It's not an envious life, really, in so many ways, is it? I, I, I don't envy that amount of intrusion and, and that amount of, um, yeah, intrusion into your life and press and, 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 and you're, you're a story all the time to people. In so many, and in the UK, a good story is a bad story. Isn't it? So you're always fishing for that bad thing. I mean, you you know you touched upon. I heard a lot of bad stuff about JT in the paddock because that's what we enjoy talking about because it's a story. Yeah. None of it was bad. It was just intriguing gossip that yeah. you would get in a paddock that, and particularly in the social media world where we work. I mean, anybody who's got kids in here will 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 probably be in touch with that. I've got four girls at home, and social media is like a fucking nightmare because they read on their feed. One of their friends has had one day in paradise somewhere. And if they've got 52 friends on there, which most of them will have, of course, they've all had one day in paradise sometime during the course of the year. So therefore, my girl's life is shit because they can see 52 days of someone else's life in their one day away, which is a real pain to, to keep up with. And in our game, it's, it's kind of like now in social media, it is so prominent. Some have got it covered working really, really well and others, buckle from that pressure and there isn't a superstar that I know that doesn't read occasionally a tweet or whatever it might be nowadays um, that it wounds them it affects them the only people that want to be famous aren't famous it's a good point and I've had no choice, choice. And like, but, but, but fame brings some wonderful things you know um, you're, you're a, a doctor, doctor. 
<laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, I'm an honorary doctor. Um, so you are the second doctor that I know in racing. But, Matt, but racing, racing brought so much, you know. Obviously, being a world champion is a gift, um, a wonderful gift and a wonderful honor to... Um, you know, I was in the NEC show a couple of days ago, and I was on stage with all of the world champions, well, that's still here, um, that could make it. And I think there was seven. I think we've produced seven, 67 or 68 world champions in motorcycle racing across all all, all genres. Uh, for a small island, that's pretty good going, isn't it? And, and I was really, really honoured, and I was really proud that I was on the stage. And I look round, and you know, you got uh, Tom Sykes and Ron Aslan, um, Dave Knight from 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 Enduro, and uh, Dougie Lampkin, trials rider, like, um, and Carl Fogarty, and and I was like, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm in this little club here, and it's, it is pretty special. Um, yeah, but you use it for special things as well. I mean, charity-wise, you always make sure that every, you know, you do the annual charities and the like as well, and make sure that you're promoting that kind of thing. A lot of superstars don't, don't they pay a little bit of lip service to that, whereas you make an effort. They do, but the, the, the bigger you get and the, the more star you, uh, of a star you get, it, the, the more pull that you get from society of wanting something from you, especially charity, because if a charity gets a sniff, you've got a few quid, they're on the phone, you know, and, and um, it's up to you really to pick one that you really, really feel that is, is a good cause. And I've been with the Sheffield Children's Hospital for 20 years, uh, and I've been an ambassador for 20 years. I've done the Easter egg run, which I've done, which was a 20 year anniversary last year. And every time I go to the Easter egg run, I then take Easter eggs around to the children in the hospital. And every single year, the charity tells us what they bought with what we've raised. And I'm able to see where the money goes. And also, you know, seeing the children, the brave children in the hospital, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the least uh, I can do. And it's, it's a wonderful cause. But um, a lot of the charities, you can't see where it's going. You don't know where it's going. Uh, and like I say, it's a, a charity, uh, it's a continuous annual thing you have got to support to keep running. And like, you know, it's, it's not something that you give a few quid to and that's they won't call you again. You know, once you're a patron, you know, you, you've got to commit to it and, and just know that you're going to be asked all the time. But the problem is, when charities ask, they don't realise that, um, you know, your mates have wanted 30 tickets to Donington, you know, and, and he wants this, he wants to come to do a shop opening for a motorcycle dealership. You know, he wants to come to do a Q&A thing, he wants to do that, he wants you there, he wants you there, he wants you there, he wants you there. And by the time then the charities want a bit of something, which they should be, you know, the important ones, You've been pulled to pillar and post, depending on how, how much of a superstar you are. Can you imagine Valentino Rossi? Uh, uh, he could do something every single day for someone because they want him to, and it'd be an honour to have him here. Can you imagine if Valentino Rossi walked in today? He's, he's more likely to walk in here and do this than he would be to, to do a big event, to be fair, with the, the likes of Valentino. You tend to find that superstars will do something because they feel for that in, in that circumstance. But actually, we've got a bit of a call into Valentino anyway. OMG podcast, <laughs> it might be coming our way. Well, I think the thing is with Valentino, now he's into cars as well. He's, he's, he's got a little bit more time. And so he's able to, based on what you've just said, I mean, the fact is that he's up to his neck in it all of the time. And that must become wearing. He's now a father, obviously, um, which <laughs> I can vouch for. It's a nightmare. Anybody not been there? <laughs> I think everybody here probably has. It might be a pleasure to come and have a chat with you. Then. Yeah, yeah, that's a fact. I have um, an excuse to get away with some kids for a bit. So where are you going, James, now? Let's, let's move it on. In, to, in to, my Volvo. <laughs> wherever that is, it's slow. The one thing about you and your teammate, I've got to say that uh, Colin Edwards, uh, his missus, Alicia, she, she once told me that uh, Colin drives like an old lady. Excuse me if there's any um, grandmothers that uh, might be insulted by that. But he drives so slow, it's frightening, which he openly admits to. Do you, does he drive slowly, Angelica? Yeah, I'm the same. I'm not does he drive slow as well? Yeah, I'm the steady. So I'm a Volvo I'm driving I'm really steady. fast, it's the car that's steady. <laughs> 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 yeah. If I didn't have a Volvo, I'd be really fast. <laughs> Where are you going from here? What's the, what's the plan for James Tozen from this point on? Um, we just touched upon, I get on an aeroplane on the 6th of December, which is not long, is it? And I've been a bit nervous because I've had seven operations on this wrist and it is fused. There's no movement at all. Does that, I mean, it obviously wrecks you as far as a motorcycle race is concerned, but your second love, yeah. that must also cause a problem with it. Massive this. problem. And I'm thankful for this event, to be honest, because it's got me back behind the piano again to practice a bit for this evening, because, um, you know, you have to. And, um, um, but when I had to have it fused after the seventh operation, it was a really, really bad situation. 
Um, because uh, I was like literally either chop it off or, or fuse it, you know, it was, it was that bad. Um, so, but a couple of years on, I always knew there was an American surgeon in Texas that was going to uh, have this special procedure that it could put a special cartilage in there, reverse the fuse and give me 40, 50% movement back. But I had just lost all energy. I, I'd lost all enthusiasm to, on risking going there and having another one at that time. Because if it had gone wrong again, it could have really gone wrong kind of thing. So, um, but I'm going. I'm going to let him do this last procedure a little bit because I've got the backup now if they if it does go wrong again and I do have to have it fused I know that life can just carry on with a fused wrist and I'm all right um, I haven't got that worry anymore about losing my piano playing because I can still play but I don't get the feeling that I used to because I have to sit to the left of the keys and I, it's awkward I don't and I've lost the pull of going to my piano with a fused wrist and that really hurts like so i am literally flying to america on a six to try and get some movement back so i i, I always want to go back to my piano because with a fuse wrist it stopped it so and if i get 40 50 percent movement back it'll be a complete game changer because when when you've got a wrist that doesn't bend at all just small things you know you can't imagine the how, how annoying it is having to 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 deal with it but uh, um so fingers crossed this eighth operation but Two months again recovering from it. I'm not looking forward to it. I must admit, Keith. Maybe I hold your cock with both hands. I never needed two hands to hold that belt, sir. <laughs> Am I less sufficient for that? <laughs> you did say about chop it off just then a moment. Was there actually a situation where you may have to have the arm, the, the wrist amputate? Um, when I crashed in Spain in Aragon in 2011, um, the hospital in Alcanis, they said it was a slight fracture. I'd be fine in two or three weeks. And I went then to the Barcelona airport to fly back and I was sat on the bathroom floor in my hotel room in tears, never been in so much pain in my life. And I'd, I'd broken quite a few things and I'm thinking, this is not a slight fracture. No chance am I literally vomiting in the toilet with a slight fracture. So luckily I listened to my body and I rang my surge, well, the rang A surgeon in the UK um, and I said, would you mind just like seeing us today? I said, and he said, oh, I've got a wedding to do. And I went, is it serious? I went, I think it is serious. I think it's really serious. So I went in to see him in Manchester the day after. My brother drove me. Um, and the surgeon came in with his cravat on and everything. And the suit, full on like wedding suit. Sounds like Harry. <laughs> okay. um, and um, he said, let's just take some x-rays. He took some x-rays. Uh, and he put the x-ray up on the whiteboard thing and he looked and as he's looking he takes his cravat off um, and he went oh shit I went what? I said um, I says I need to organise a theatre right now he says because in 24 hours that could be paralysed um, and he said I'll do my very very best James but um, that's not that's not looking good uh, on on you being able to ride a motorcycle again so I went from a slight fracture the day before on the, on the Sunday on whatever day it was and the day after, then I was getting my gown on in the hospital uh, with my brother having to go home to Sheffield from Manchester to get some stuff because I was all of, all of a sudden stopping in to then drive back again and the operation didn't get my movement back. And that's how it worked out. And here we are. Here we are. So, back to the question originally before that prompted um, that particular one. Um, where are you headed from here? Well, after I, the, so after, yes, 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 if it's successful, yeah. what are you, what's your plans goes, for the well, future? I'm going to be on the MotoGP grid in 2025. <laughs> <laughs> Next You're up. laughing at? <laughs> Valentino was manager. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, now, if it goes well, and if I can get 40-50% movement back, I will be playing like I used to, and I will, I will have piano in my life forever, which I'm, that's my priority. Um, but it might allow me to ride. Um, it won't allow me to race for 50%, I don't think but it might allow me to ride. Um, I have hinted that if it's enough um, to maybe enter like just an endurance race or just, you know, like Troy Corsa did the BMW thing. The F900 thing, yeah, yeah, the F900. I mean, I'm not sure if I would embarrass myself because I have not ridden a motorcycle at all for 12 years and I know Troy rides a lot. And when he finishes Yeah, but that, he is pissed most of the time. True, true. <laughs> but that helps at his age, um, especially with the braking. Um, uh, but I don't think I will. I would love to. Do you know the one thing I'd really like to do if I could is just do one more race and finish my career like I wanted to and have that choice. 
I've, I've done that, and that, that's it. That's to bed. And that's, I never got the chance to do that. We'd all have that, wouldn't we? Yes. Yes. And what about the music career? I mean, obviously, that's yeah. taken a bit of a backseat in has, recent times. Yeah, because they fused the wrist, I, I lost my enjoyment, and I lost the ability to do the fast stuff uh, with the piano, and I lost my confidence to perform. Um, and um, so the, the band went, and then COVID hit two years, and the Brexit hit, and it was difficult to tour Europe and all the rest of it. But if I get 40, 50 percent movement back, um, I will, um, I'll, I will, I will get in a studio again and, and write album three, um, and possibly get a band and, and possibly tour again. Um, but, but like, this is such a serious situation, like the operation and the wrist. If it goes wrong again. I'm going to be two years again in trouble until they fuse it again. That's the problem with the operations. So you know, like Mark Marquez with the operation. Like it, it's not, not the case of just going in and just tweaking it. Every operation that you have, it's three months, four months, until you know where, you, where it's going to be. Um, so if it goes well, I would like to write album. I've, got, I've written album three. I would like to record album three and get a band together and possibly perform again, because I love performing. The whole thing about my grand playing the piano and everybody having a good time, that's what touring and, mu and playing music is all about to me, so I'd love to do that. And if I can ride a motorcycle again and maybe do some track days, or my, my, my middle nephew has just bought a motocross bike at 21 years old because his mum and dad, my brother, didn't let him have one because of all the shit I went through. But he's 21 now, he still wants to do it, so he's bought a bike and he's doing it anyway. <laughs> Um, and just to go to the motocross track with him and have a razz round uh, and, you know, and all that, I would love to. Well, we can't do a motocross track tonight, that's for sure, but we can get you to exercise your, um, your wrists over here for one more tune, if you wouldn't mind, James. James Tozen plays for us again. Thank you very much, James. Pleasure. <laughs>